Good morning, church. My name is Annie Purdue Olson, and I'm the business pastor here at the church. And as Mary mentioned, I've been here around a little bit, a little while as well. Um, And in July, I had the opportunity to share with you. I shared a message about how God has designed us, given us a unique set of gifts for a kingdom purpose, that he has a plan for us and he has a purpose for us. And since that time, I've been meeting with several people at Woodland Hills Church who are fulfilling their kingdom purpose. I have been so impressed with the amazing things that are going on through the people of this body. There's some incredible kingdom work being done because of the people that are a part of this body, and I was blessed to hear many of the stories. As I listened to these stories, I saw a theme, something consistently, a thread that ran through all of them. And it was the, it was the message, the, the point that each individual, each person had to make an intentional commitment, a decision to pursue God's purpose for their life, despite the challenges, despite the resistance of the world around them. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about this morning. So I'm titling my message, The Kingdom Challenge. Facing the challenges of this world as we fulfill the purposes that God has for us. I'd like to open us up in a word of prayer. And can I get a couple people that might be willing to pray for this message as it goes forward? Thank you very much. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to serve you and use the gifts that you have given me in whatever way you see fit. Lord, I pray for this message, Lord, that it will go forth with your authority and with your words Lord Jesus, I pray that you will use it in whatever way you want to in the lives of the people that are here in this room, including me. Lord, speak to all of us, I pray. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. As I heard these stories, I was reminded or drawn to a particular scripture in 1 Peter. 1 Peter has many themes that are written to the church of the time. Uh, But one of the themes that drew me is the theme about suffering. Chapters 3 and 4 deal with Christians who are suffering. And First Peter's challenge and Peter's challenge to them. So I started by doing just a little bit of background research. What is going on in First Peter? Who is this group of Christians that Peter is writing to? And so I found that the the recipients of this letter were Christians that were living in the provinces on the very outskirts of the Roman Empire. This was not your main centers in the Roman en- Empire. It was like the backwoods. It's the backwoods of the Roman Empire. And these were Christians that were experiencing some pretty significant persecution. And it wasn't the kind of persecution that was uh, empire-wide. It wasn't the Roman government endorsing and saying all who are Christians will be persecuted, abused, discriminated against, thrown in jail. It wasn't that kind of a persecution. It was much more of a localized persecution within their community. It was their neighbors. It was their neighboring businesses who were discriminating against them, who were abusing them, who were considering them second-class Christians, second-class citizens because they were Christians. It was because of their walk with Christ, because of their faith in Christ, that they were experiencing the kind of suffering that First Peter is talking about. I want to make sure that I distinguish the difference between the kind of suffering from tragedy or illness or loss or pain in our lives as opposed to the kind of suffering that First Peter is talking about. So I'd like to do just a little bit of a comparison contrast for you here, and I've got some slides to kind of reflect this, because we're going to be talking about the First Peter kind of suffering today. Suffering from loss is the result of a fallen world. Because we live in a war zone, because there is sin and evil at work in this world, people are going to get hurt. And difficult things, tragedies are going to happen. That kind of loss is the result of a fallen world. On the other hand, the kind of 1 Peter suffering is the result of fulfilling your kingdom purpose as a Christian. These were believers who were doing what God had called them to do and then experiencing suffering as a result of it. As we move forward with fulfilling our purpose, we will experience the resistance of this world. In regards to suffering from loss, Scripture expects healing. Scripture expects expects redemption from these losses. On the other hand, suffering from persecution, Scripture expects perseverance. Perseverance that builds character and gives hope. As we experience the kind of suffering because we are partnering with Christ to do what he's called us to do, we have hope. That kind of suffering can give us hope because we, are, we know, we have the deep conviction that we are fulfilling the purposes that God has for us. We are partnering with Christ, and that is where our hope comes from. Suffering from loss. The response of the church, 
is to pray and to believe for deliverance for all of those who are suffering from loss. In regards to suffering from persecution, the response of the church is to express solidarity in the face of opposition, to unite as a community. As you read through 1 Peter 3 and 4, you can see the message of community is intertwined with the message of suffering. Because you see, Peter knew that he had to exhort these Christians in the midst of their suffering to cover love, covers over a multitude of sins. Bond together in hospitality and unity as a body because we cannot face this persecution alone. The exhortation of 1 Peter is to unite as a community in the face of the opposition that we experience. Lastly, suffering from loss, Christ is our advocate to the throne. The role of Christ as we suffer from illnesses, from tragedies, from different circumstances in our life that bring pain is our advocate. He walks alongside us. He is partnering with us towards healing. He advocates for healing. He brings people into our life that can support us during those times of loss. Suffering from persecution, on the other hand, what is Christ's role? Christ's role is as an example. He suffered when he came to this world, he had a message, a countercultural message, and the world came against him, and the world resisted him, and he experienced suffering. If we move forward with the same message, the same purpose that Christ had on this earth, we are going to experience the resistance of this world. And Christ is our example as we face that. Now, the first Peter Christians suffered because they were Christians, because they were demonstrating Christ. They were discriminated against, discriminated against, and they were considered second-class citizens. They were wrongly accused and often thrown into jail as a result. But Peter challenged them to persevere and to unite as a community. In America today, we rarely experience the kind of persecution that these Christians did. But like those Christians, I think we will experience the resistance of the world as we move forward to fulfill God's purpose in our life. Greg talked about last week that God's favor means partnering with God. Doesn't necessarily mean that God shows favorites or that we are his favorites, but it actually means that we get to partner with God for his purposes. God has given each of us a passion, and he wants to see that passion fulfilled through us. But we will experience resistance. I believe the exhortations of 1 Peter can speak to us about perseverance and uniting as a community in the midst of our current conflict where we combat the messages of this world. So I'd like you to turn to 1 Peter if you would. We're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles with you. It's also going to be on the slides for those of you who don't. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. The exhortations of this scripture of the author of 1 Peter are that opposition is expected. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal. Do not be surprised. But in spite of that, we have hope because we have the deep conviction that we are partnering with Christ. We have found his favor and he has a purpose for our lives. This is the challenge that I heard in these stories. The challenge is the kingdom challenge. What is this challenge? It is to partner with God despite the opposition of the world. And I think 1 Peter has some challenges for us. It is because of the pressures of the world that we often hesitate to accept this challenge. There are two areas of conflict between the world and our purpose that I want to talk about today. The first one is the messages of this world about who we are. You see, the world has a message that says only certain people can make a difference. 
You need to look a certain way. You need to be a certain way. I've really screwed up my life and, and I don't really have anything to offer. Or maybe what I do really doesn't make a difference. Well, 1 Peter has something to say about that as well. So I would like you to go back to 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms, if you speak, you should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If you serve, you should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. The interesting truth about this scripture is, is that God, the name God is mentioned four times in these two short verses. Because the reality is, the truth is, is it's not about us. That's the truth. It's about God. It's about the fact that he has given us the gifts. They are his gifts bestowed upon us for his purposes. We are speaking with the very words of God. And we are serving with the strength that God provides. It's not about how we look. It's not about what we have done or haven't done. It's all about God. That is the truth that comes against the lie of this world about who we are. He has given us a challenge, but he has equipped us to meet that challenge. I want to tell you a story about Deb. This is one of the stories that I heard over the last couple of weeks. Deb grew up in a Christian home. But the kind of Christianity she experienced was the kind of Christianity that said you had to look a certain way, that you had to be a certain way. You had to go to church so many times in order to be a Christian. It wasn't at all about a relationship, and Deb realized very early on at a very young age that she could not measure up to that standard. And when she went to college, free from the pressures of that legalism, she let loose. She started partying and drinking and getting involved with a very dangerous group of people. Violence was very much a part of her life. She was raped five times during those days. And it was a very difficult experience, so traumatic for her that she began to block out the memories of that experience. She transferred to another school and moved on with her life trying to forget all of those things that had happened to her. But they had a way of coming back and haunting her. They started haunting her dreams at night. She began to have flashbacks of the violent experiences that she went through. And in her depression and in her confusion, she began cutting herself and burning herself. She attempted suicide three times. In this darkness, she would go to, go to doctors and psychiatrists. They had all sorts of diagnoses for her problem. They put her on a boatload of medications to try and treat her symptoms, but they never really dealt with the heart issue for her. She realized after a while that this was not working, so she decided to see a different psychiatrist and a different counselor, and she ended up in a Christian counseling center. And they began to minister to who she was and what her needs were instead of treating her symptoms. And they encouraged her to come to our refuge ministry here at the Woodland Hills. Every Thursday night, we have people who come and join together in support groups to support one another through the life's difficulties that they're experiencing. When she came to the refuge, she experienced a kind of Christianity that she had never experienced before. The unconditional love, it wasn't about her money, it wasn't about how she looked, it wasn't about if she was smart enough or good enough, it wasn't about what she had done or hadn't done, it was all about Christ at work in her life. And they loved her unconditionally and she experienced God's love for the first time in her life. She describes it as for 10 years having lived in a house in darkness and all alone. And then God came along and he threw open the windows and let the sun shine in. Amen. Praise God. In the midst of her healing, Deb discovered that God had a purpose for her. She describes her purpose as to help people and give them hope. You see, God wants to use her story and her experiences to help others. So every chance she gets, Deb shares her story, hoping that in some way it will minister to somebody else and give them the freedom that she's been able to experience because of the love of Christ. She is stepping out and she is helping others at the refuge, and she's signed on the dotted line to become one of our care partners to walk alongside someone else in a one-on-one -on -one relationship and encourage them through life's difficulties. Every day, the, the lie of this world still comes against her, and she has to battle it with the truth, the truth that it's not about her, it's about God. Her identity is in him, and her purpose in, is in him. But that's a constant battle, to fight against the messages of this world. And the refuge is a community for her. The, the support groups are a community for her 
that come alongside her and help her persevere. Another message of this world is that what we do really doesn't make a difference. How can I really make a difference? Well, I know Eric Peterson has something to say about that because I talked to him in the last couple of weeks too. Eric's life was transformed. It was changed forever on November 28th of 1999. He was in a very serious car accident that put him into a coma. His family was told that he would probably not live, but if he did live, it would be in a vegetative state. His family began to pray. Those of us at Woodland Hills partnered with his family and began praying for him, praying for his healing. Two months, two months after he was in that coma, he woke up, Amen. miraculously healed. Hallelujah. Praise God for the power of healing. Eric knew right at that moment that he had been redeemed, that he had been saved from death for a specific kingdom purpose. And that purpose was to serve God. And you know, it hasn't been easy for Eric because of the accident. There has been long-term ramifications to his life, disabilities that he will struggle with for the rest of his life. He wasn't able necessarily to go back to the job that he had, and his life was changed forever. But you know what? Eric had a purpose, and he knew what that purpose was. Eric's mission is to make people feel comfortable and experience God's love. And he wanted to serve and give back to God what God had given to him. So each week, Eric comes in at 3 o'clock on Thursday afternoons and he begins setting up the tables and the chairs and making coffee and making juice to create a welcoming atmosphere for our support group ministry. So when those people walk through the door, they can experience God in a way that they've never experienced God before. Because of the ministry, because of the difference that Eric is making, hundreds of people's lives are being changed every week. It is a lie that we have nothing to offer. The message of the world, we must resist it. First Peter says that we have something to offer, and it's all about God. Amen. The second area of conflict with the world that I want to talk about is the messages of the world that say to be normal and to be comfortable. It is most important to be normal. When we start fulfilling God's purposes in our lives, we won't look normal. And for the most part, we won't, it won't be very comfortable. First Peter, I think, has already established that. We will look a little bit different than everyone else, and it will be a fiery ordeal. Oftentimes, fear can keep us from coming out of our comfort zone. So I would like to turn again to the exhortations of First Peter. First Peter chapter 3, verse 13. We're moving backwards in Scripture today. Verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer for, to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. 1 Peter chapter 3 challenges us not to be afraid when we suffer for doing what is right. When we resist the lies and the messages of this world, we should not be afraid. We need to be prepared to give a, an explanation for the hope that we have because in the midst of our suffering, as we persevere, we will look a little bit different. It will cause the world to ask some questions. I would like to tell you about Ryan and Molly Nielsen, who are some missionaries here at the church I listened to their story this week, too, and was very blessed to hear about what God is doing in their life. Ryan and Molly didn't necessarily feel the call to missions when they got married, but through a series of long-term and short-term mission trips, they discovered what their purpose was, what God's mission for them was, and it was to help the hurting children in Latin America. That was their call, and they had a passion for that. So they partnered with Living Hope International Ministries, and they went down to Mexico. It was a little bit of a difficult transition. They already had two boys, and one month after arriving in Mexico, Molly found out that she was pregnant with their third. So their first year of transition was very difficult. The boys, the older boys, had a really hard time fitting in and feeling at home, and it was just a, a challenge to learn a new culture, to be taken out of your comfort zone. But after the first year, things began clicking. Things began connecting. Ryan was really catching a vision for what this ministry was because, you see, Living Hope International was planning to purchase a large area of property and then construct 
all of their buildings on, in one place and be able to minister to the children of Latin America from one central location, calling it the City of Hope. Ryan, being a, car a carpenter and a builder by trade, was extremely challenged by this part of the ministry and was just catching a vision and a hope for what this could be and was challenged by that. Isaiah, their oldest son, had been put into a Spanish-speaking preschool, and they were very nervous that it would be hard for him to fit in, but he did, and he enjoyed it and looked forward to it. Molly was getting ready to start volunteering and partnering in ministry as well, uh, working with the children in Latin America. So everything was clicking for them, and then Josiah, their middle child, their three-year-old, began to get sick. On and off, he was sick. Maybe it was a flu. Maybe it was the virus. And then he ended up developing clusters of broken blood vessels starting on his legs but then moving all over his arms and his body ultimately ending up even in his mouth as they took him to the doctor the doctor when they walked into the office said this is very serious this is very serious and they sent him all over the city doing lab work and trying to diagnose what the condition was and that night at 8:30, when they met with the doctor they were informed that josiah their three-year-old had leukemia Seven o'clock the next morning, they were on a plane back to the Twin Cities. They landed in the airport and met by family. They went to the emergency room at the Children's Hospital in Minneapolis, where it was confirmed by the doctors that, yes, Josiah had leukemia. His blood counts were so low, he needed an immediate blood transfusion. The treatment for his type of leukemia was a three-year commitment. Six to nine months of very intense chemotherapy and treatment for the, the leukemia, and then three years total of ongoing treatment. Besides the shock and the grief and all of the transition of coming back to the States, Ryan Mo and Molly had the question of, what do I do about this ministry that God has given to me, to us? And that was a hard question for them to answer. Do they put it on hold? Do they put their passion on hold? Or do they move forward with what God has called them to do? For the next four months, they didn't answer that question. They took care of Josiah they transitioned, they grieved, they did all that they needed to do to accept what was happening to them in their life. But then they felt the call. Then they felt the passion burning within them and they knew that they needed to continue in their ministry. So being a stateside representative for Living Hope International, Ryan took on the project of planning and coordinating for the City of Hope down in Mexico. So he's living in the United States, caring for his family in the United States, and he's serving the children of Latin America in Mexico. That is the passion that God has given him. And most of us would say, well, that's not very normal. During, due to life circumstances, maybe it was wise to put that on hold. But he had the passion, and they had to move forward. Molly is going to be coordinating the English as a Second Language ESL classes that we offer here this fall through the Latino ministry as part of her mission, as part of her purpose as they minister here in the States, still fulfilling their call and their mission to Latin America. Josiah's treatment will be done on January 25th of 2008. In the fall of 2008, Ryan and Molly plan to return to Mexico. And because of what Ryan is doing right now for the ministry, it's hopeful that they will be able to begin construction that fall on the City of Hope. Praise God. When Ryan and Molly were sharing with me their story, Molly said, the decision we have made is a countercultural decision. And that is true. There are so many reasons in life to keep us moving in the status quo, not to rock the boat. This is also a challenge that Nick and Madeline Avignon have had to face. They knew right away that God's call on their life was ret to return to Haiti and to serve their Haitian brothers and sisters. And they came to Minnesota during a time of preparation, Nick to finish his bachelor's degree, Madeline to get her nursing and health education degree. But even while they were here during their preparation, they knew that they had a purpose to serve and to minister. They lived in the Frogtown area and began ministering to the drug addicts that lived in their neighborhood. The children came to their home and they ministered and partnered with uh, the children to, to just give them love and shower on them support and unconditional love. It was a great time for them. Not only in their neighborhood, but in their family. They took on the challenge of adopting six girls. Three of them uh, American girls and three Haitian girls. And in two years, they went from being a family without children to being a family with six children. Ministering, doing kingdom work in their community and in their family. Well, Nick got a promotion at work, and, and as he was going through this, things were going so well, but he felt unsettled. He felt like, you know what, I think it's time to go back to Haiti. 
So he shared this with Madeline, who was utterly shocked. She's like, with the things that are going on in our life, we have six children to think about here and six children who've been through a lot of hardship in their life. I just want to give them a little bit of the taste of the American life before we go back. You just got a promotion. Now is not the time. Her friends came alongside her and said, let me pray with you about this. And she just could not pray. Her heart was heavy and it was just very difficult for her to pray. One day, four Christians came to her home came to their home and knocked on their door and they were passing out tracts. And Madeline was like, oh, no, 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 go to the next door. We're Christians. We don't need the tracts. Save them for someone else. But Nick just had this burning passion in him for Haiti and he would just tell anyone he could all about the story and he began to share with them about the call that they had to Haiti. And they asked to pray for Nick and Madeline and Madeline was resisted at first. But finally, finally she gave, it, gave in and she let them pray for her and for Nick and as they were praying for her, they laid hands on her. And as they started to pray, the spirit just flooded over her. And she began to pray, and she couldn't stop praying. And she just began to pray. And all of the practical implications for her family, all the comforts of the American life, just washed away. And she said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, and I will do the purpose. I will accept the challenge, and I will do the purpose that you have planned for me. Life in Haiti has not been easy for them. Haiti is a country filled with violence and poverty. The sacrifices that they have had to make and their children have had to make have been significant. They face danger almost on a daily basis. Because of their connection back to the United States, they risk being kidnapped. They have had their house broken into. There are some times when they leave their home that they don't know if they're going to be able to come back alive. They've had to flee Haiti twice because of threats against their life. Someone would say, are you crazy? What are you doing? You ask Nick and Madeline, why are you doing this? And they say, it's all about the village of Lugu where we serve. When we are in Lugu, there is no conflict. When we are in Lugu, there is no sacrifices. There is only God's power at work. Us fulfilling God's purposes and what he has for us. There is peace. There is hope because they have persevered. They have resisted the messages of this world and followed the calling that God has for them. George Barna has done a survey to try and find out what is the greatest fear in people's lives. You want to know what it is? The greatest fear is our life not counting. See, God designed us for a purpose. He has given us gifts that he wants to do something incredible through each of us. There are no favorites. He has a passion and a purpose for each of us. But it requires risk. It requires resisting the messages of this world. So the question is, where do we start? I've got three things I want to share with you about how to get started on finding the purpose that God has for you. The first one is being ready to partner with God. We need to be ready. With each of the stories that I heard, there was a time of preparation, a time where each of these people, each of these individuals had to get ready for what God had called them to do. For some, it was healing. Both for Eric and for Deb, they had to have a time of physical and emotional healing from the trauma that they had experienced in their life. Sometimes it's preparation and learning. Both Nick and Madeline came back to finish their degrees to prepare themselves and equip themselves in a tangible way to fulfill the mission that God had called them to do. Sometimes it's time to transition and grieve. For Ryan and Molly, they needed that four months after finding out about jo Josiah's diagnosis before they were ready to commit to the ministry that God had for them. There is a time to process and to grieve. There is a time to listen to God's voice. We need to hear what his purpose is for us and what he has for us is important. This last August, we've been doing a class called Discover Your Gifts that I shared when I preached in July. I shared about that class. We had 55 people sign up for that class, an overwhelming, unexpected number. We have another class scheduled on September 24th, and that's already filling up. So we're throwing in an extra class this coming September 3rd to do another class because it's a great opportunity to tangibly look at different ways that God has gifted you and to seek God, listen for his voice, and hear what he might have for you. Sometimes the thing that God has for us is right in front of us. I want to tell you about a woman that has really been a blessing in my life. Uh, when Kevin was sick with cancer and we were going through so many treatments, I started getting cards from Mary Jo Van Gumpel. And she, was, she lives in Wisconsin. She heard about Kevin. And she started every, every couple of months just filling out a card with maybe a special verse, praying over that card and sending it to me. It was such an overwhelming a, a sense of 
uh, gratitude that I had because those cards would come right at the moment when I needed them the most. She was praying over those. I later found out that Mary Jo herself had suffered from cancer. And after going through the cancer treatments that were so hard on her body that she ended up experiencing also a series of strokes, she was unable to work anymore. But right in front of her, as she heard the needs and the compassion gifts that God had given to her, she had to act. She had to fulfill the purpose that God had called her to do, and it was just right in front of her to do. She began filling out cards. There's many, many people who receive the cards that she has on a regular basis of encouragement as she fulfills God's purpose in her life. The second point I'd like to make is how can I find the time? With all the demands of this culture, as workers, as parents, as all the family and the social obligations that we have in this world, how can I possibly do more? Well, remember when I was talking about First Peter and he was talking about the perseverance and the suffering, it was intertwined with a theme of community. We cannot face this alone. We cannot do this alone. And that's the message of First Peter. And the thing of it is, is that we don't have to do it alone. We can accomplish way more together than we can ever accomplish alone. A ministry of the church that I think exemplifies this really well is our mom's spiritual spa. There are a cluster of small groups that have come together around a common purpose. Their purpose, their mission, is to encourage and empower mothers with small children. The demands of motherhood make it very, very, very hard to do this alone. One person could not pull something to, like this together on their own. But as they unite as a community, as they come together as mothers, they can help mothers experience Christ in a way that they hadn't experienced before, bring them out of isolation, partner with them around the demands of culture and the demands of their time. Together, working together, they can accomplish way more than they can alone. That's the beauty of a body, is together we can unite in solidarity and come together to do ministry. The last point I'd like to make is we need to keep moving. Have you ever tried to steer a car that's not moving? Oh. Oh, moving that tire, turning that wheel can be really difficult. But if it's moving, if you're moving forward, then God has the ability to be able to direct our paths. And sometimes we just need to take a step out. Because it's easy to get caught in the comfort of preparation. It's easy to get caught in the, well, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know where God has me. And to spend the time getting caught in that analysis paralysis as we try and figure out what God has for us to do. You don't necessarily have to fix everything before God is ready to use you and has a purpose for you. So I have one more story that I want to share with you, and this one I have in video. It's a story of a guy who was trying to discover what God's call in his life was, and he just kept moving. He kept moving until God finally showed him what his purpose was in life. This is the story of a man looking for his calling. Like so many, he had a gift, but wasn't exactly sure what it was. Greg Boyd knew that he should get involved at Woodland Hills Church, but how? Eagerly, he joined the hospitality ministry. I'm very excited about this thing. I'm strung out on coffee, I've been going three weeks like this. I'm sitting in caribou, and I'm having a meltdown in the middle of caribou coffee. Unfortunately, his love of Java turned quickly into a caffeine addiction. With more energy than ever, Greg tried out for the dance team. He had all the moves, and the spotlight loved him. But it just wasn't enough. You want to shout, it makes you want to dance. Uh, it, it can get you a little excited, I hear. I hear that. Undeterred, he volunteered in the worship ministry, where he thought his worship leading experiences would help. I am going to help. I help worship lead here. They didn't. Naturally expressive, Greg then offered to help in the deaf ministry. Again, he was met with rejection. Most hearing impaired attendees know only American Sign Language, not Greg Boyd Sign Language. The neural nets are, he's the Terminator. The neural nets are that he rescues people. The neural nets are that he saves the world. Going along forever, going along forever, going along forever. Boop, there it is right there, see? see? His seemingly endless search brought him to the care ministries. However, his manic behaviors became very apparent and they quickly asked him to leave. I'm a 
walking zombie. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I'm scared. Just, I get in these manic drives where I go a couple weeks and three hours sleep, and I, 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 I get kind of blitzed. So I found that if you change the square into a triangle of contrary relationships, it's really the foundation of uh, Western logic. Not only that, but it's got five proportions, Fibonacci sequences all over the place. It's got a fractal quality that's gorgeous. I hadn't cut my hair for a while. I had this bushy hair, and, and I'm talking about triangles and hexagons, laughing, crying, trying to insist that there's a five proportion in the hexagon. And all of a sudden, it occurs to me as I look around that I'm certifiably nuts. Nearly in a state of despair, he tried desperately to join a covenant group, but his loner mentality and self-loathing turned others off. There's nothing good in me. There's, not, there's nothing pure in me. There's nothing clean in me. I am altogether a sinner. Everything I do is just sin. Uh, you know, I am, I am snail's breath. I am maggot juice. I am scum. I'm just living for Jesus. It's the least I can do, really, when all he's done for me. I turn from the pleasures of the world. Oh, I, I do like them, though, but I turn from them. I'm giving them up because... I love him so much. As a last resort, Greg threw himself into the discipleship ministries, where he quickly grew a Messiah complex. Can you handle the truth? <laughs> you want the truth? I'm the Savior, I'm God, and you're not. Your love for me should be such that everything else in comparison is like hatred. Uh, in other words, your allegiance to me should have no competitors whatsoever. You want to follow me, it's going to cost you absolutely everything. Your own personal Jesus Someone to hear your prayers Someone who cares Your own personal Jesus Lucky for Greg and for everyone at Woodland Hills, this story does not end here. It seemed the only position left was senior pastor. This is where he belonged. This is where rhythm, dance, caring, and triangles all combine into one. Senior pastor of a church that wants to have fun and love others. Being a Christian is a party. It's fun. You should be enjoying yourself to the max. I had to throw you guys for a little bit of a loop. <laughs> you know what? The thing of it is, is when we're fulfilling God's purpose for our life, when we're doing what he has called us and designed us to do, it will be fun. It will be a party. There will be rewards, and the hope and the passion and the peace that we have will outweigh all of the messages of this world.